Um, and traditionally, we start the meeting with public comment on any items that want to come before the board um, that are not specifically on tonight's agenda. The two items on the agenda are a site plan amendment um, at 278 Birch Pit Road and also a special permit amendment and major site plan over at uh, 31 Chapel Street. So if there's anyone in the audience who would like to speak to other items, please come to the podium and identify yourself and just where you live. All right. Um, Nancy Smith, Chapel Street. Nancy, may I ask you, is this in regards to the application that's coming up tonight? Uh, nope. This is actually gives a little background that refers to the ANR and the original rezoning of um, the um, of 33, just to give a background, but I'm really looking at um, something re regarding 33 Chapel Street. So it, it, it may so sound like I'm going there, but I'm not, I'm going somewhere else. All right, my name is uh, Nancy Smith. I'm from Chapel Street. Last fall at a hearing on rezoning 31 Chapel Street to PV, the board spoke very positively about rezoning the entire block to PV, naming non-conforming lots adjacent to a PV district as the reason. Most of our entire neighborhood of older homes would fit in that non-conforming category. I spoke against it. Director Mission Councilor Foster met with members of our neighborhood who supported the project but opposed PV expansion. Thanks to the board pulling back on the rezone of the block and strong support from city council, only 31 Chapel was rezoned to PV and the house at 33 Chapel was saved. We are grateful and all agree there was no reason to change the block. At the March 9th planning board, I spoke against the ANR land swap, which intentionally attempts to create a reason by making a small sliver of the home at 33 Chapel's lot PV zoned. An ANR cannot be rejected by the board, only it's only a judgment for um, on a subdivision status. The board could only offer a favorable vote. This leaves the home at 33 Chapel and the block still vulnerable to more PV creep. If 335 Chapel sells, the newly refurbed home on 33 becomes very valuable to builders looking to tear down more starter homes, eliminating any chance a first time home buyer could even have a shot at either home. The affordable four family rental behind it becomes vulnerable, leaving renters out in the cold. This is the housing crisis. PV zoning was created for major projects like redeveloping the old state hospital property. PV used on an existing residential neighborhood will paint a big red profit bullseye on our lower and middle income homes and rentals for builders to exploit. Zero parking is okay in PV, which allows builders far greater freedom to tear down affordable homes and rentals and build whatever they want with very little oversight or limitation. Home prices and rents skyrocket. This is the housing crisis. The neighbors are against PV zoning creep into 33 and beyond. I am wondering why we are seeing no action to rezone parcel 11 to URB, that sliver of PV zone property swapped to 33 Chapel. Doing so would protect the home and the neighborhood while ensuring the project fully meets the intention of the PV rezone passed by city council last fall. If the board could push a rezone to an entire block to PV, couldn't it push a rezone of parcel 11 to URB? If not, couldn't Mr. Perry and Sunwood Builders do it? The URB rezone should easily pass city council and 31's largest parcel 12 would still define 31 zoning as PV. It would be a show of good faith to a supportive neighborhood who readily accepted a change from six apartments to 22 overnight. It's a very small ask, really. We simply want to protect our homes and neighborhood, as city council intended. The size of parcel 12 would allow all project work on 31 Chapel to be done to PV design standards, even with a parcel 11 rezone to UB, which would protect the home at 33 and the neighborhood. Protecting our low and middle income homes and neighborhoods really needs to become a priority because it really is the crux of the housing crisis. So I hope we can look at something that can do both, that can allow 31 to continue to be built PV. We have no interest in like changing that. We like what it does, but we want to still protect our homes. I'm hoping a solution like this can be accepted. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else who'd like to make a comment to the board about other items? So Carolyn and I re received a couple of other comments by email um, that seem to be in the same tone and, and subject matter um, about the change of PV. Um, 
So maybe we can make those as public comment now rather than during the hearing at 31. What do you think? As long as it's just about the zoning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Unless um, both of the, I think the women are in the audience who are wanted to make those comments. Would they like to speak to this themselves? Can't they only type anywhere? Hmm? Can't they only type anywhere? Oh, that's right. Thank you very much. They can only type the, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. So that being, I forgot that the uh, participants on Zoom can only um, interface with us via the chat feature. Uh, they can't come to the podium and speak. Um, I wonder then if you do me a favor, would you be our reader? Sure. So Jenna White, our vice president, will read. Um, See your title. And vice president. <laughs> so, Kamala would be impressed. OK, um, this um, is an email from Jacqueline McCreener uh, addressed um, as public comment for tonight's uh, planning board meeting. Jacqueline writes, I believe it is important for city officials and staff to foster honest and open communication with Northampton residents due to the fact that the planning department's decisions have serious and far-reaching impacts on the city, its residents, business owners, various additional stakeholders, the environment, and wildlife. Residents in Ward 2 feel very strongly about containing planned village zoning, known as PV zoning, which gives enormous flexibility to developers. PV zoning has already begun to creep across the road from Village Hill to Chapel Street. The neighbors in this area of town have accepted the change from URB zoning to PV zoning at 31 Chapel Street only, which is the former site of the old and long, long-standing metrics car repair shop. Residents of Ward 2 have been told that 33 Chapel Street and the rest of the block will retain its URB zoning. There's been temptation by some city officials and staff to rezone 33 Chapel Street from URB to PV zoning due to a project being undertaken on that abutting property. However, due to the efforts of concerned residents and city councilors, URB zoning has been upheld at 33 Chapel Street, while 31 Chapel has been rezoned to PV. Further complicating the issue are the ANR land swaps between 31 Chapel Street and 33 Chapel Street and the subsequent zoning issues which have arisen. This has caused reasonable concern among neighbors. Presently, the zoning of a 15 foot sliver of land that is being swapped between the two properties stands to be clarified. Residents of the neighborhood strongly believe that the 15 foot sliver of PV zoned property being swapped from 31 Chapel to 33 Chapel should be rezoned to URB, just as the ANR land swap of URB zoned land from 33 Chapel to 31 Chapel Street stands to be rezoned to PV. Residents have been told that 33 Chapel Street will remain a URB zone. Regarding 31 Chapel, they have graciously accepted not only the change in zoning from URB to PV, they have also graciously accepted the change in plan for the site to house office space and 22 residential units. The original plan had called for office space and six residential units. The change in plan has resulted in an increase of 16 additional units, which is a significant increase. I respectfully and strongly urge the planning board to honor the URB zoning status at 33 Chapel Street for the entirety of the property and thereby rezone the 15 foot piece of land involved in the ANR land swap between 31 Chapel Street and 33 Chapel Street from PV zoning to URB zoning. Thank you. Thank you. And there's one more um, from uh, Jackie Balance which is the neighbors of 31 Chapel Street are still wary, wary of encroachment of PV zoning into their community. Kindly reassure the public that their homes and properties will be protected from such zoning changes in the foreseeable future. Jackie Balance, Florence. Well, thanks for those comments. Is there anyone else who would like to make a comment this time? <clears throat> okay, well, hearing none, We'll move to our business items. Um, the first one at seven o'clock is a site plan amendment for additional tree removal at 278 Birch Pit Road, map ID 30D-016. This is a site plan amendment, a simple majority vote is required by four of the seven members. It's a technical permit. Um, 
the board determines the standard for the site plan previously approved. They're still met for landscaping and tree removal, and it's not more substantially detrimental to the neighborhood um, and the, the, that the existing non-conforming house was. Okie doke. So is the applicant here and would like to make a presentation? I'm Megan McDonough. I'm the executive director at Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, and we're planning to build three homes. Oh, I think the microphone's still on, or? Let me say, got it. Um, uh, we're planning to build three homes at 278 Burt's Pit Road. The land has been divided into three lots. Um, in the previously approved permit, uh, a land a uh, disturbance zone was created and some tree protection of trees along the road um, near the driveway entrances. Um, after further consideration, we have looked at the solar access to the south because we hope that all three of these homes will achieve zero net energy or the possibility of zero net energy depending on the homeowners. Um, and in order for us to provide that opportunity for the low income home buyers to have an affordable electric bill, we need to have access to the sun. So we're asking to cut some of the larger trees to the south. Um, when we began this tree work, we also took a closer look at the trees that we were protecting along the road and the arborists that we were working with determined that they were in poor health. Um, so it, we have currently have them in a tree protection fence, um, but we think that re their removal at this point in the construction project would be good for the, that they're not in, they're not going to be long lasting trees um, and that it will be better to remove them now while we're already in tree removal mode. And the only other thing I would mention is that um, Berkshire Design Group looked at the uh, area of the property that would be disturbed, and it is still less than one acre um, with the additional tree removal. And they put in a request for an exemption for stormwater management to the DPW today that was approved. And also, I think an exemption of any kind of uh, payment into the tree fund, the lack of better term, because of the affordability situation. Yes, thank you. Uh, that because these are all going to be affordable homes, there is that ex potential for an exemption, and we'd request you do that. Are you ready to answer all of our arborist questions? Um, I am not an arborist, but I will. I will do my best. Um, and I just clarify that um, under the zoning, there's not an automatic exemption. I mean, this came in under the affordable housing um provision of the zoning that allows um the board to waive um much of any of the requirements that might be um otherwise applied to homes for the purpose of creating affordable housing and that replace tree replacement under the tree calculation is not required if it's infeasible so there's still you could it it just doesn't apply the tree replacement um calculations wouldn't come into play, but you could um, also look at um, requiring some kind of trees to be planted. It just doesn't have to be in lockstep with that replacement. Yeah. Okay, great. Question for the applicant. Is there a place you can put like a, a solar array that's not on the cover? I don't believe so. We also, each of the three houses is on its own individual lot. So there's no shared common land. So it would be also um, difficult from an ownership standpoint. Um, also, if it was ground mounted, it would be lower. And right now we're two of the homes are two story. So that at least gets them up a little bit higher. But most of the trees are towards the south. Um, even the, there is a portion. They're kind of clustered to the side to avoid the wetlands in the far corner to create a buff greater distance to that buffer, but. So I think one of the things we might ask about, um, we sh I certainly understand the uh, <clears throat> kind of the conflict, the dilemma we have about the tree canopy and yet also the push to net zero energy. 
uh, which the city really wants also, but it's uh, six of one and half and a dozen of the other. Um, so we we might be requesting that the applicant plant some trees along the streets along the street in front of the the units more than are, that are sown on the plan. And I know that the um, previous permit required planting of three tr new trees. Um, so we already uh, are expecting to need to do that. Okay. So I, I think we we might request two trees per those individual lots rather than just the one one in front of each lot. One of the lots has more frontage than the other. So it may make sense to put more trees on the lot with more frontage than than per house lot. Uh-huh. Yeah, I have some questions. I mean, uh, I, we, I keep on hearing uh, Arbor say, you know, people say that Arbor said the tree is a bad time. Does, does that mean, like, did you ask him, does that mean, like, the person has a cold or the person is uh, that a stroke? To the front of that? Yeah, I, I didn't ask for that analogy. Um, well, I, I mean, you can use other analogies if you want, but, but like, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I don't. I don't mean to, to yeah. say anything about the arborist uh, community, but it doesn't seem like any arborist would say that trees are in great shape. I mean, what he said in the letter provided was that the trees in particular have existing storm damage, numerous rot pockets throughout the canopies, substantially weakening their structure. And realistically, these trees pose a threat to not only the street and power lines, but to the soon to be home, uh, constructed homes on the property. Um, so he did believe that they were uh, potentially a danger for falling down, I think is kind of what you're getting at. Yeah. And just to clarify, the, the ordinance does say, I mean, this is a special consideration because it's in a separate section of the ordinance where waivers can be granted. But generally, if um, someone wants to claim uh, or be exempt from tree replacement, um, because a tree is in bad health or hazard tree or um, dead, then an, a certified arborist has to submit an analysis of those trees and why they meet that criteria. So things like storm damage and rotting cores and things like that are taken into consideration. And a full hazard assessment as technically as what's um, my understanding of what arborists do was not done for this, but the um, that's um, in there were the arborists did speak to that, but didn't sort of check all the boxes of what I've seen as sort of a full hazard assessment. Um, I was up there the other day, and I'm also concerned that these trees are in the public shade. That the of they're public shade trees. They're within the easement of the city property. Um, I believe that this tree warden noted that they're, and the survey shows that they're just inside the property line because otherwise it wouldn't be up to the planning board to determine. Right, right. It would be um, the city, the tree warden that has would have to hold a public um, right. hearing right. for it. So these trees are surveyed as just inside the property line. Um, some of them are, they said are, are Norway maples. Some of the ones to the south are pine trees. Some of the, the really large tall ones are, are um, pine trees. Is it possible that the tree that can you have a tree lower than all seven is an I don't think you can. Not really. Not okay. not these kind of trees, you know, some some more shrubbery you can do that too. And they pollard trees like and they trim down the branches, but as far as the trunk goes, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. We I, do plan to leave the stumps in the ground for these trees that are further to the south. So to that'll preserve some habitat in, in that area. We don't plan to dig them up. We just wanted to uh, talk them. And we want to. So it, it made a 
a comment about um, the cost, like the, the utility cost. How do you, in terms of that analysis, without what would the utility be? Like, what or what do you get by putting in? Like, we, we cut this thing down. How much lower is their utility bill actually really going to be? Yeah, I I can't put a dollar amount on it. Um, you know the we did do uh, the architect the retired architect who's working with us on this project um, did a shade analysis of the largest trees to the south and modeled the impact, and it's fairly significant. My understanding is that the effect of shading on solar panels is sort of exponential. So you shade one area, and that has a a, a large impact on the production as a whole. So that, that part I understand. Okay. What I'm saying is that if they, let's say that there was no solar panels, but there's also shade that you're getting from those trees. But I 100% appreciate a, a lower utility cost. Mm -hmm. But if the utility costs, if we're talking about, you know, let's say $200 over the course of, of of a, of a season, I'm not sure that that is worth it. But if it's, you know, a thousand, well then that's a that's a significant chunk of money. Um, and so I I I guess I'd like to understand that better because I think having I mean those trees are valuable for our community and. Um, I, I just, but I'm, I, I 100% understand the, and appreciate this balancing act. I just like to know what I'm balancing. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I, I do not have sort of the, um, we are looking to make these houses all electric homes. So it is more than just the plug loads. It's also their heating and their cooling bill. Um, so the hot water bill. So everything that goes, which tends to be higher, the highest in the winter um, when the sun is in the sky less, if you're producing less solar energy and these large pine trees to the South, I think, I mean, from some of the shading, it looks like at December 21st, it's half the, in the middle house, it's most of the solar panels would be shaded. So I do think that that would leave them uh, without renewable energy as a real, I think it would be significant. Um, I can't, I'd be guessing if I put a number on it, but I think it would be the majority in the winter of their bill. So it doesn't really work well, period. So. Um, because of the, the cloudy nature of things, but yeah. but I'm so, sure if there, there's some kind of battery back up to them too, that they'll, on good uh, days, I'm, I'm sure it's a less of a draw than the other three seasons, but yeah. I, I, anyway, my, my point is, I think that I think we've heard this argument a couple of times, and I think that I'm not, again, I'm not against. Yep. You know, this, I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, I think that, that in the future, we just need to make sure that. A dollar it, number is attached to it, but it just doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't just say yeah. that there's a cost. <laughs> there's a cost. Sure, but I don't know how we, you know, the hope is that there's families in here for 10, 20, 30 years, and I don't know how we project kind of the electric rates going forward versus, you know. We can't what, do that, yeah. but we can say, we can't, but we can say the tree's going to be there. Yeah, theoretically for a while too. So, yeah. um, I, I just think that, I mean, if they can model, if they can model uh, the tree coverings of solar with a some sort of fancy computer thingy, I feel like Those they can things. they can model the cost of. Uh, yeah, any solar company will give you the projected. Cost savings. Yeah. I have a question though. Um, are you guys going to put the panels on or are you going to leave it up to the homeowners to decide whether they want to do it or not? 
Um, our, we our plan right now is to do it our is part of the construction process. Mm -hmm. Um, we have had a great partnership with Piner Valley Photovoltaics from up in Greenfield yeah. and been able to negotiate on costs with them. They're doing the solar for the other project we're doing on Burt's Pit Road right now. Okay. Okay. So there's kind of two tree issues here. There's the, the two huge white pines in the back of the house and some other smaller trees that's around the solar array. And then there's the trees in front of the house. And that's more about possible damage down the road to the houses or they're going to die anyway so it's kind of bundling two different situations here for us um and the safety for removing those really large trees now is the time before there are houses there it would be very difficult to safely uh fall because they now they can fall essentially where the houses are going to be built when we cut them down and then that's less disturbance to the wetlands to the south and to, so i think now is the time we can do it to also not leave a huge bill and risk to those homeowners in the future sure. i think we've seen the last couple of storms we've had over this past winter too where we've had a lot of down trees um you know um just the one from last week um i think if we have an arborist that's saying that these have storm damage and we're building three brand new houses, then we, we should take allow them to take those trees down. Um, I personally, um, I mean, uh, leaving the trees in the back versus not, it, it, we, it will allow the uh, homeowners to save some money, but it's also um, saving resources, which is what we're after, you know, allowing them to utilize renewable resources. So I like the idea as well of, um, you know, I, I, I saw Bruce's um, shade studies and it's quite clear that, you know, there's a, there's a high impact from those trees. So, you know, if we're uh, pushing for renewable resources everywhere we can, I think it's personally, I think it's a good idea to allow them to take them down. But I also do think we should ask that more trees be planted in replacement of those. It's quite a substantial amount of trees. It's a pretty heavily wooded area, but it's also, um, you know, two trees per lot rather than one, I, I don't think is uh, too much of an ask personally. So, yeah. I agree. You, you mentioned, I'm sorry, I just can't find the information quickly enough that one of the houses has more frontage than the others. We have the number of 260 of frontage in total. Like this one here. Um, do you, the two smaller lots, do you know how much frontage they have? Uh, no. Yeah. No. I'd have to look at the site plan here. Um, I think that's on this. Yeah. I mean, if the board wanted to request that we do six trees for the project, I think that we could figure out a way to do that and choose something that would work. Um, I just know that between the driveways and the sensors is a curb cut for each of the lots. Um, I mean, the one the one story house is more than double the size, the frontage of the two other lots. So, and the the clearest space is all the way over to the left um, on that larger lot. Because we also have to consider a line of sight for people pulling out of their driveways and things like that. Yeah. Well, it's hard to say without the exact calculations here, but the um, notes are that in most districts, it's standard to have one tree per 30 feet of frontage. So I don't know, again, without having the numbers, I can't say, but to me, it seems nice to spread them out if possible, but also recognize that clearly there's three times or so as much space on one lot as the other. So I think if we can get six in there total, that would be good, but they might enjoy having some additional, the smaller lots as well might enjoy having some additional trees in their frontage. Yeah. yeah and it may work to, if we end up, if you approve removing those ones that are currently there, we might be able to replant in that same area, um, which is because that's right now the driveways are on either side of the trees we had planned to retain, um, which before we got out there and realized that they were not in good shape. 
So just to clarify for the board, the section um, in the code that's relevant, first of all, in order to get the the these three lots um, permitted, 50% um, of the units have to be affordable, but also the permanent energy sources shall be from grid supplied electricity or otherwise not use fossil fuels. That doesn't mean that they have to put solar panels on the roofs, but you could also require as part of a condition that if the panels are not on the roof by the time the certificate of occupancy is issued, that then they would have to pay into the fund or plant more trees or give some window so that you're you know, assured that the trees are coming down for the purposes of allowing solar access to those panels. Um, the other piece of this section says that um, when significant trees on the property are cut, they should be replaced on site with new trees to the extent feasible without blocking the solar photovoltaic systems, but no payment in lieu is required when such planting is not feasible. So um, full and, and full mitigation is required for cutting public shade trees, but these aren't public shade trees. So there is a, um, even though, again, sort of it goes back to that they're not required to use the calculation for planting, but certainly um, that can be considered. Yeah. So they're not required. I mean, they're going to cut these things down. Aren't they required? Aren't we going to be requiring them to put solar on them? Not necessarily, as long as they're using um, they're using non fossil fuels or using electric grid, um, they don't have to do it with solar panels. I mean, I'd be very much against that. But that's why I'm saying you could condition it to make sure that that's what's going to ha that that happen. So if you know at the end of the day they cut the trees in anticipation of putting solar, but then they don't use solar, they do they um, come up with some other mechanism to meet the standard. Then you'd want to see um tree re replacement or maybe have them come back to the board um uh, for an amendment or something yeah what's tricky is the whole south side of this lot now is clear cut so they would never want to plant more trees young trees back there because then in the future it would also preclude any yeah. kind of future solar planting so that'll always be kind <clears throat> of there and back there um so all the planting of trees, it has to be done pretty much up front on the north side of these houses. But that sounds like a good uh, kind of compromise to ensure that um, solar voltaic is used um, and that they're kind of pushed into um, providing those extra plantings if need be. And I think you'd be amenable to that kind of language for a condition. And we've oriented the houses so that they are facing south. We've adjusted our roof line on the two-story so that it has more of the roof towards the south so we can fit more solar panels. So we're we're actively preparing for that. Yep. No, and we're very appreciative that affordable housing is being built there. I mean, don't get us wrong. We're not trying to put more roadblocks in your way. Um, you know, it's an unusual area of Northampton because it really is all fields around there. In the back of you in the front on both sides you know there isn't much of a tree canopy other than what's in this lot um <clears throat> so uh, other questions for the applicant so i'm i'm comfortable following M melissa's kind of theory that you know it's the greater good really is that we're trying to get to a place of net zero and um using the electric grid rather than fossil fuels um and again it's a it's a trade-off with the trees and the canopy these are two huge white pines too white um they're they're old um I, the arborist didn't speak to their um their health or their kind of permits but um I, he did say that because the other trees have been removed around there, they're going to be susceptible to wind and all white pines are great for kind of splitting and cracking and, and falling, especially at this size. Before we before we move on, are we okaying this because it's affordable housing? Like if this was some project that was like, that's incredibly wealthy person. 
I don't think we're okaying it because it's affordable housing. We're just saying they don't have to follow all of the replacement protocols that non-affordable housing has to. We're not requiring them to replace X amount of, put X amount of new trees in. What would the cost of that be? I don't know what the calculation would be. I don't think anybody measured the um, circumferences of these trees that are coming down. They're on the survey plan, the the total um, calculation, but I, I didn't add them up. So here, so the replacement requirement is a formula. And so because they they fall into this category or they were originally permitted into category, it doesn't require them to calculate that formula. We didn't do that here. Um, at the moment, the um, replacement formula is you, you know, let's say you take down a hundred inches worth of trees, you have to replant 50 inches or make a payment into the um, tree fund. And so if you couldn't say 50 inches of two inches each, so that's 25 trees. If you couldn't fit 25 trees on site, you could plant say 10 trees on site and the rest, the rest of the 15, you can make a payment in lieu of. And so Anyone else who's not who didn't get a permit under this provision would be required to replant um, or pay into the fund. So, you know, um, 15 trees, two inches each, you know, that's 30 inches. Right now, the going rate is $100 an inch um, for that. But that's that's that changes depending on the market and all of that. So. Carolyn, can you remind us, isn't there another, I know we've seen projects that are taking trees down because of solar access, but I don't remember the specifics of the provision off the top of my head that they have to show that it can, the house can only be oriented in that way in order to gain solar access. Can you just remind us how all of that in other contexts works? Sure. So would just remember, anybody can cut any tree they want on their property. If you're coming into the planning board or the zoning board for a permit and you cut a tree of a certain size, then because you need permission for other things, then you're responsible to replace those trees, no matter whether you're taking it down for solar or anything else in accordance with the tree formula, tree replacement formula. Um, there are special permit provisions that, um, wherein an applicant could come to the board to waive or be exempt from the entire replacement calculation if they are doing net zero um, building and they're providing some other benefit. So open space or affordable housing, or there's, a, there's, a, there's another sort of avenue by which an applicant could reduce the total replacement costs, but they can only do that for the trees particularly um, that are coming down in particular for that solar access, not other trees on the property. Thank you. So let's um, split this up a little bit. Are folks okay with the trees to the north side of the house that the arborist has deemed to be unsafe and uh, um, lack of, well, oh, thank you, Karen. Yeah. Um, so at this point, we'll turn it over to the public. If there's anyone here in the room, council chambers, I would like to speak to this application. And Carolyn and uh, our Zoom participants, has anybody raised their hand in chat to say that? There are two chat comments. Mm -hmm. So no one here? Okay. Um, a chat from um, Andy Keither, ground mount solar on the south side would not need so many trees cut. Solar heating during the summer will eat a lot of electricity for air conditioning cooling in the direct sun. The trees also serve to block the view of um, the array of jail yard lights from those houses. Saving some choice ones for shade might be possible with ground mount or tracker solar on the south fence line. So Andy Keeper was from, again? Um, um, Northampton. And um, so um, actually 309 Burks Bay Road. And that's the only chat item. So I see 
Jacqueline iPhone has her hand up. I'm not sure what yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then just to reply to, the, I mean, just as a comment, there are wetlands on the south side, so um, there's not a lot of room to put anything. You can't put anything within the wetland boundary that's already gone through the conservation. Yep. So the wetlands are on the south side, not on the west side, um, where the largest part of frontage is. Um, I didn't see the wetland markings when I was there. It was probably too too long ago, but the, um, it's on the site plans that were submitted. So there is buffer zone across the entire thing. There are wetlands and buffer across the entire parcel that was then subdivided into yep. three lots. Yep. Um, but the wetland is really along the south side. Um, and the tree removal is within the wetland buffer. Um, and some of that had already been approved previously. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just additional trees. Um, and then there is no buffer zone to the west. Um, there is still wetland on that. So yeah, OK. Yep. Yeah. But you can plant trees in a, in a buffer, I guess. Yeah. All right. Um, any other? So there are no more comments from the public. Last chance. Any other comments, questions from the board? Okay. Um, so there's a motion then. Seeing that Jacqueline's iPhone hand is up again, you might just remind those folks of how to participate. Um, so again, uh, the, we're reminding folks that unfortunately, if you're in a Zoom participant, you can, um, you can only interact with the board and staff via the chat area. We're not uh, accepting kind of verbal comments at this point. Um, uh, quite a few people um, sent us comments prior to the meeting which is legit. And some people came in person to make comments. Sorry, Jacqueline. All right. So we have before us a, a request for a site plan amendment for tree removal. Um, we talked about a couple of conditions that if the trees are, one condition was the tree to be removed. Um, we need to have evidence that solar has been installed on the roof solar panels prior to a certificate of occupancy. If not, then the uh, the applicant, Pioneer Valley Habitat, would need to abide by kind of the 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 tree replacement formula, which in, which would imply a lot more planting of trees um, along the property. And would that be just for the trees? on the south or for all of the trees that they're I, taking down? I, just for the trees on the south, because the other ones don't impact the solar. So we can't really, I don't think, hinge that the trees on the north coming down impacted whether solar gets put up or not. Right, but you also might consider that since they were, the arborists noted that they were sort of hazard trees, that they then wouldn't fall into that category. Okay. Um, and the other one is, uh, the DPW has also asked the applicant to submit a new request uh, for a waiver from the stormwater uh, permitting yeah, process. Right. Okay, thank you. Who would I be without the vice president? <laughs> Do you want to vote today? Sure. I move closed public hearing. Is there a second? All right. Any discussion? All right. All in favor of closing the public hearing? Unanimous. All right. Any more discussion about the application? Uh, so in addition to the solar, are we asking them to plant additional trees along the frontage or not? Have we decided on that? Yeah, yes. Six, six. six total. So they already had three, right? And right. we're asking for an additional three. And can they be anywhere? Or do we want one on each lot or spread somewhere along that frontage? Personally, I think you leave it up to them. I think that makes sense to you. I mean, um, yeah, what makes sense, what makes sense. 
Yeah, I, I don't quite buy into the sight line problem with the driveways. You know, that's one thing for shrubs, but I don't think we're talking about shrubs. We're talking about trees that'll be mature at some point. But uh, I'd rather see them spaced evenly along there. But again, I, I think it's right that um, once the driveways are in, you'll have a better idea of what kind of room you have left for the tree planting. And there's a list, of course, of the trees that uh, the city promotes for being planted in those areas so near the road and new construction that I'm sure will be followed by your arborist and landscaping team. Okay. Any other questions, discussion? Is there a motion to be had? Make some notes so I can take a run at it. Go for it. I, I, uh... I should have that on. Um... All right, so I move that we approve the site plan amendment for additional tree removal at 278 Burt's Pit Road, map ID 30D-016, um, with the conditions that two new trees per lot be planted along the frontage uh, at some point throughout construction. Um, and also that if solar is not installed, um, by the time of certificate of occupancy that the applicant will need to abide by the tree replacement formula. So I get it. That sounds good to me. I second. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any more discussion? All right, all those in favor of the motion. Uh, we have four in favor. Anyone opposed to the motion? And Mr. Taylor's abstaining. Okay. So four is a quorum. So the um, the amendment passes, is approved. Good luck with your project. I'm sure there's more work to be done between you and the staff of the planning office and the building department, but... Well, we had 60 applicants for the three houses, so... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. One of the things that I don't think I'm, I'm just like confused about is like the direction of 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 like where you need to have solar. And if the south side is clear, why do we why do we need to cut more more trees? It doesn't mean this and that's Pat, but the point is that I don't really understand solar in this product all the time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. I'd like to have a better sense of, of its value and how it fits into this are our, our goals. So during a quiet night of the planning board meeting, have an unbiased uh, exactly expert right. come in. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, I find the application, I mean, the applicants submitted the solar study about the, the shaving study for yeah. um, that parcel. And um, I think it's helpful on a parcel by parcel basis. So to see those things and where, you know, the hour of the day, the day, the month of the year for that particular parcel shows the shaving. Um, I don't know if we're going to get at the cost of year I'm thinking about, especially when we come and we have more organization talking about protection. Right. Yeah. right. Well, that was a unique, yeah, that was a unique, unique situation to this, this one that that was part of the, the reason to do it. Um, you know, I assume that solar does make it cheaper to of these things, but I'd like to have a better sense of what of where. Sure. And then also, you know, the idea that one comment about the uh solar arrays that are ground mounted, um yeah. they still it can be obstructed by trees, but uh there may be some yeah, more flexibility there. To install right. Because... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I know that there's the the solar arrays are more expensive to install because for whatever reason the metal pieces are more expensive. Okay. Um that's just I know it's through business, but um so let's try to look into that and bring somebody by here to give us a little workshop. 
Okay. Well, at this point, it is now, is that clock off? It's now time to open our second hearing, um, uh, which was uh, advertised for 7.20 p.m. for a special permit amendment and major site plan for new 27,984 square foot multifamily and office buildings with two curb cups at 31 Chapel Street. Um, map ID 38A-11 and 12. Um, this is a super uh, uh, special permit amendment needs a super majority vote required five of the seven members. Um, and the site plan will also need just a simple majority vote four of seven members. Little drawings. It says the host disabled screen share. Yeah, well, that's the big ones. I can barely hear you. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to pull up the plans. One second. Okay. That's okay. It's still saying disabled. Hmm. So. <clears throat> um, let me just check one other thing. For our Zoom participants, we're just having a few technical issues here. Well, she's um, trying to figure that out. I'd like to start out by introducing myself. I'm Rebecca Lee with Arlevec Associates from um, 40 School Street in Westfield. I'm accompanied tonight by the applicant, Mr. Shaw Perry, as well as the architect, Mr. Charles Roberts. We'd like to start out by um, <clears throat> acknowledging some of the abutters and neighbors' concerns about the portion um, within 33 Chapel that's now currently zoned PV after the A&R plan was endorsed at the last meeting. Um, the applicant is willing to um, rezone that entire parcel as URB. So I just wanna put that out there. <laughs> Oh, okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. All right. Let's go to. Okay. Just bear with me. I'm just going to open all the documents so that it's a, a seeming a seemingly transition. Sure. Uh, at least we can hope. Some of these files are a large, so they might take a little bit to load. <clears throat> So we are here tonight to um, present the proposed apartment building at 31 Chapel Street. That will be um, the address. Um, the project's titled Two on Prince. See. 
Um, so the first drawing is the existing conditions plan. This property is zoned um, within the Plan Village District. Um, it was formerly the Matrix um, Auto Repair Shop. Um, it has been historically developed. There was a, uh, a garage, a repair garage on the property at the time of the survey, as well as um, some miscellaneous storage trailers. Um, <clears throat> majority of the lot was paved. There's also an existing drainage infrastructure on the property as well. There's a catch basin towards the middle um, with a connection to the um, existing city um, storm drainage system. This is just the demolition plan. This is just showing um, the items that need to be demolished in order to um, accommodate the, the new site improvements. So clearly the, the repair shop is to be demolished. Um, the existing catch basin and associated drain pipe will be demolished up to the extent to where we're gonna be connecting into that same connection as you'll see on the, on the previous plans. Um, we will also be demolishing a good portion of the existing utilities um, in order to accommodate the, the new uh, design and new utility connections. Yeah, sure. So this is a site layout plan. As you can see, um, we're proposing a three-story apartment building on the western side of the property. Um, the, the apartment buildings equipped with three egress points, one to the eastern side, which will be the main entrance, one to the western side, which will be um, access for the tenants to get to the uh, bike structure um, in the back, the bike rack in the back, as well as the trash and recycling enclosure. Um, there's also an egress point to the north as well um, to provide access to the sidewalk that runs east-west along the north side of the street and has um, a pedestrian uh, means of traverse to the other side of Prince Street. We are proposing um, a off two-story office building on the eastern side of the property that will be associated with the apartment building. Um, we have proposed 22 parking spaces throughout the um, lot with bi-directional traffic flow. Um, we've also proposed two electric vehicle parking spaces to um, promote energy efficiency. Um, <clears throat> we are proposing, you know, the adequate handicap, number of handicap um, ADA accessible parking spaces, as well as the ADA compliant ramps. Um, all grades meet that. I also want to point out on the layout plan here, we all are proposing two curb cuts, one to Prince Street, one to Chapel Street. Um, currently, there's almost the entire length of along Chapel and Prince are two big curb cuts. So we're essentially reducing um, the existing curb cuts to be um, more, to promote more ad, uh, organized and um, controlled traffic to and from the site. This is just the grading plan. The site is fairly small. Um, we're matching existing topography to the extent practicable. Um, the idea is to direct the storm water around the apartment building. So from this high point here to the north, to the south, 
Um, <clears throat> we have some low points in within the parking lot area that will also collect runoff. So there's a low point here in the middle of the access drive. There's also a low point um, here, kind of out in front of the office building. Again, to collect the, the runoff and convey it to our proposed subsurface infiltration basin, which you see here on the drainage plan. Um, <clears throat> we will be collecting um, all impervious, all runoff that um, comes from the impervious surfaces, and we will be um, treating it via deep sump hooded catch basins and water quality unit prior to um, discharging it to that subsurface infiltration basin. The uh, in subsurface infiltration basin is equipped with an overflow connection, and that overflow connection is the same connection that was existing um, on formerly. So essentially the, the overflow connection, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but it connects to a couple of structures before it ties back into um, the existing city infrastructure. And of course, where you know our runoff, our pre matches the the we're reducing essentially the peak runoff. So, <clears throat> as far as utilities go, the um, proposed office building will be reutilizing the existing water branch that enters the site. Um, it will also will also be reutilizing the sewer connection we're going to be installing a, a new sewer manhole um, right at uh, right over the property line here and we'll have one connection that goes to the office building and the other connection that goes to the apartment building there will be two new um, water line one for the fire protection and one for domestic water um, and after conversation with the water department the connection will actually be more likely be off of Prince Street. However, that's still being finalized at this point in time. Um, both buildings will also uh, obviously receive electric from the existing utility poles that exist along Chapel Street. There'll be overhead, I'm sorry, there'll be overhead electric lines. Or? The overhead converted to under underground. So this is the proposed landscaping plan. I'm just gonna zoom out so you can see it a little bit better since we put it at a larger scale. Whoops, my apologies. It's a little difficult to see on the screen. Um, however, we have provided landscaping throughout the site. Um, we've provided buffers in between um, the buildings and the public ways, as well as the parking lot and the public ways. Uh, it's a di diversity of different plantings, and um, you know we've been coordinating with Carolyn and also with DPW since there is an existing storm drain infiltration trench that cuts through the north side of our property here. Um, we just have to be aware of what we're planting so as not to adversely impact that infiltration trench. And this is the photometric plan. So we're proposing two um, light poles kind of towards the center of the site to provide adequate lighting for um, any patrons or tenants that are parking in the lots when it's um, darker out. We've also proposed some down lighting. There's gonna be canopies that are gonna be in the front of the office building, as well as over the um, egress points of the apartment building. So those canopies will have um, down lighting, very um, dim down light lighting. We're also proposing three lighted bollards on the Western side of the apartment building. And this is just for safety purposes so that the tenants who are accessing um, the bike storage structure and the trash enclosure um, have adequate lighting. And that summarizes the 
presentation of the civil site plan set. I'd now like to turn it over to Mr. Roberts to go through the architecturals. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Charles Roberts with Cunardal Architects. Uh, thanks for being here this evening to uh, look at our proposal. I wanted to start off just with a kind of a, a, a Google Street View walking tour of some of the buildings up around Village Hill, just to give remind everybody of a sense of the context of, of sort of the the built in, the built environment up there. Um, here is a view of our site. It's kind of it's, it's an amazing site. It's it's an entrance, a gateway, and an exit way for for Northampton in a lot of ways. You you see it um, from Prince Street, from Chapel Street, as you're going out on 66 and coming back into town from both ways. And so it's actually at a, it, it's at a cusp and 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 a, at a strategic site in a lot of ways. And uh, and we we've, we've done our best to to uh, take advantage of it and 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 be within the spirit of uh, of the Village Hill uh, district and and creating housing opportunities and recognizing commercial development as well. Um, these are just some views of, of the old hospital buildings that have been um, up through all three story buildings, um, historic and in their own right. Um, similar similar height and massing and scale to what we're what we're proposing. Our building isn't 160 feet long, but <laughs> um, the uh, the gatehouse, which was you know uh, following with mass development strict um, Greek revival guidelines, um, uh, the dormitory building, um, the service net building, which is kind of a of a, of a handsome modern building. Um, the it was Col Morgan, now it's something else, but across the way, a, a kind of a sprawling industrial modern building. Um, some of the assisted living. In, in, within, in within the campus itself, sort of transitional architecture, um, more um, contextual architecture, multifamily, three stories. And I think this is the TCB, affordable housing up there. Um, so I now I have to figure out how to get to the next PDF. Okay, so here's our here's our proposed development. Um, this is this is a a view from. Uh, let me just see if I can blow up a little bit. So, oops. Oh, you mean you mean the uh, the the little that guy there? Okay, yeah, that's better. Let me just get that get that up out of the way. Um, so this is this is an aerial view, sort of look, looking at the site, um, right at the uh, the crux of the site. The uh, the office building is in the foreground. Um, the the parking area uh, and and landscape area that Rebecca was describing is is in the middle of the site, and the apartments are tack are, are tucked in. Um, Along the uh, on the western edge of the site, so so the development kind of tears up in scale as you move back through the site. Um, there's an interesting play going on, I think, between the the office building and the apartment building. Um, we were thinking about, well, do we keep the architecture the same, or do we do we vary it? And it seemed like to make them different would have been contrived in a way. So there's there's a certain kind of consistency and and logic to tying the architectural expression of the office building and the uh, and the uh, apartment building together. Let's see here. Um, just to run through the floor plans quickly, there's gonna be tenant storage and mechanical area on the first floor. Um, on, on, I mean, on the lower level in the basement of the of the building, there's a central circulation core stair and elevator and second means of egress stair out here to the north. Um, this is the first floor plan and typical second floor plan. Um, there's uh, at the at the entry at the entry level here. You come into that that central core lobby area with the elevator, um, the main the main stair serving the the apartment building, and then branching out into the two wings. Um, this is uh, all studio apartments and one bedroom apartments. Um, so 
trying to create a, you know apartments that are affordable within scale not not literally affordable housing but but affordable within scale um uh, they're all going to they're um um the the way the way the building is configured um, with this sort of recessed core and the two the two blocks coming off from either end allows us to uh, get corner light in each unit so it maximizes natural daylight within the unit makes them very livable and uh, um, most important um, aspect for us um, this is the third floor plan so on the third floor we've got the same uh, and, and on the western half, we've got the one bedrooms here on the end, the studios in the middle. Then we've got some two two bedroom apartments facing south with balconies. Once you get up to that height, it'll be very nice views of of, uh, of the mountains or the Holy Oaks and lots of nice light and air. And uh, those, I think those units can be pretty nice. Um, these are the elevations. So um, we have some renderings that read a little better than these elevations, but. We're working with a combination of metal siding um, on the lower half of the building and then a warm wood siding, um, rain screen siding um, up uh, on the third floor and kind of bringing those two materials together to uh, create an expression that's warm and at the same time durable um, with the metal siding. So it's it's got a it's got a nice balance there. Um, this is the uh, the the refuge shed and bringing it into the same simple vocabulary as the uh, as the uh, the apartment building little bike shed so these are the cantilevered posts that'll come out of the ground and the bikes will hang up and hang from the uh, from hooks um, vertically under the shed plan of the office building this uh, uh, lower level basement um, on the left um, on the center is the entry level plan this will be an a uh, uh, storage and then accessible bathroom accessible conference room um serving the uh, uh serving the office and then up on the third floor would be the uh um uh private offices so some would develop the sunwood development that would not be open to the public so the public's invited to the first floor but not necessarily up to the second floor for accessibility purposes and similar language um with the materials and uh and general character of the building here these are some elevations that uh, are some renderings that hopefully kind of give a sense of how we're weaving together the the wood siding with the metal siding um and working to break up the scale of the building and let there be some give and take and movement within within the within the forms uh down here's a view of the uh, the bike shed and the uh and, and the the refuse shed out that west pathway that rebecca was pointing out um, views of the uh, the office building. This one here is kind of what you'll be seeing as you come dead on down uh, up uh, up Route 66 or Chapel Street. And then um, we just got a couple street views here, uh, photo montaging these in, in, into the site. This top view is is looking into town from Chapel Street, and you can see the uh, the office building here on the right, the apartment building on the left, the landscape parking spot in the middle, and you can just sort of make out. Um, some of the Village Hill architecture in the background here. This this view this view here is um, as you're coming up up Chapel Street to head out of town. You see the office here, and again the, this landscape buffer zone we're going to uh, create around the front of the site, and then the uh, the apartment building in the background. I think that's it. Thank you. Clarifying question. Yeah, just a little bit more information, I promise. <laughs> um, I just want to note that since we've submitted it um, originally, we've incorporated Carolyn's in the planning department's um, comments, sent in revised drawings. That's what you're seeing here tonight. Um, since then, we've also received comments from the DPW and the tree warden. Um, those were just recently this, this week. Um, I did have a conversation with the city engineer, David Valletta. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we went through um, all of his comments and our intended responses, and he was um, okay with how we are going to address them. I just want to uh, make that note, and I'd be more than happy if it pleases the board to go through those comments if you'd like. 
um, it's up to you. So I, I would just not so much the DPW comments, but the tree wardens comments. Actually, I think I could. Did you? Yeah, I could, they came in today. Um, <laughs> generally says, I mean, just was making comments about, um, there were some conflict, comments about conflicts between the um, utility, the infiltration trench and then building. And so he was just generally speak because the trees proposed are to meet the street tree planting um, requirements. And he's asked to have the trees pulled away from the buildings a little bit because um, for over time, as the trees mature, there will be uh, potential impacts to both the building and the trees. So um, they're shown tightly packed up against the building. So he would recommend that they be pulled back a little bit. Um, but otherwise he noted that there was uh, a good variety of tree species proposed. So um, that was, I think sure. a helpful comment for the applicant. And it'll be nice to see some trees and landscape plants at that intersection <laughs> instead of cars at oil Even trucks. And, and, yeah, yep. okay, great. Um, is there any, did you guys talk at all? Is there any risk about that cut through, like anyone going from Prince to Chapel? Yeah, chapel. To chapel and, and cutting through the property? Avoiding the lights. Yeah. So there's no sidewalk <laughs> along Chapel on. Um, you know the southern, essentially the southern side of our property. Um, so there's no means or methods for pedestrians to safely get. You know alongside of South Street. So we're encouraging them to go towards the north, cut across through the sidewalk, which will have all DPW um, you know, signage and regulations, and then access the, the existing sidewalk. I think he's implying about cars. Oh, cars. Okay, I'm sorry about that. There's, there's, there's a stoplight there. I'm just wondering if it's such a direct cut through. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if there's yeah, I issue think, or not. I'm up there a lot, Sam. I think the uh, the stoplight when you come down Prince, mm -hmm. you can turn on right all the time there. You know, it's a okay. turn on right. You're not stuck if you want to get back on Chapel. Okay. Um, but if you wanted to go, no, because then they go that other street by the church, and yeah, well, they, they've just done that weird one, like Philly. Like car traffic was an issue at one point over there because they stopped yeah. the direction of like you whatever that whatever, whatever the next street up is like you can't, you can't one way, way. Oh, okay. yeah. On, yeah onto it right? that was part of the mitigation actually that um the mass development was required to do mm -hmm. for the redevelopment of the state hospital oh, yeah. to make that a one way because there were concerns that there would be used as a cut through. So that was 20 years ago or something. Yeah. So this is just... Yeah, I mean, the other thing is this is a, um, you know, a lot. So it's not um, intuitive to say, to think, I think as a driver that, oh, I'm gonna just gonna cut through this landscape, you know, if DPW didn't, apartment building. didn't think it was an issue, then, you know, it was just, it yeah. just seemed like it was just this very straight line. So that yeah. was, I mean, on the other hand, this is a wide open curb cut on both sides now. So you could just, you have, it's a free for all, and this is tightening it down to just, just to, say that, yeah. you know, <clears throat> the more controlled, organized, systematic. All that stuff. I think I get the sense of what you do. <laughs> <laughs> um. Why do I know there's a couple of people who may, might want to make a, a comment um, before it gets too, too late. So, I um, know, can I ask a sure. question before? Can you talk about your plans for snow storage or removal from your site? Sure. Um, given the size of the site, we did want to create a snow storage um, areas to the north and south sides of the parking lot. However, we needed that landscape buffer area, so we don't want to dump the snow on the landscaped area. So um, the intent is to truck off any snow accumulation off site. That intent always scares us because inevitably over time we see that the private contractors 
<clears throat> we'll find a place to dump that. Um, this Sunwood may handle that differently, but um, it's hard to get a backhoe in there on a regular basis to remove that snow. So um, that'll be great to see if it does happen. But <clears throat> okie doke. Other questions? Well, um, I, I'm I'm more of a comment. I think so. There are 22 proposed apartments, right, and 22 parking spaces. Yes. Is that so? I think I just would have a concern about like overflow parking and, um, you know, if you, everybody there has a car, um, just for the neighborhood in general, because I think there might be some street parking and that sort of thing. Has that been taken into consideration at all? So just correct me if I'm wrong, your concern is that there's too many parking spaces provided or? No, too, too few. few. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the zoning ordinance actually has a maximum number of two parking spaces per unit so we are which is 44 spaces so we're cutting that basically in half um you know considering one car one vehicle per unit is typical i would say in in an apartment complex um shawl i don't know if you want to speak any more to the parking situation sure my name is shaw perry and um Can you come up to the microphone <laughs> Hello, my name is Sean Perry. And um, so we try to create a balance between too many and too little. The provisions of the bylaw are not requiring us to have any specific number per unit, like maybe in other conditions around town. And we felt that on these kind of an apartments that there are 50%, 500 square feet studio and 45%, I believe, uh, one bedroom of 640 square feet. We're likely to get one person. We assume that half of the building would be occupied by students that may not have a vehicle at all. The proximity to downtown encourages riding public transportation to just walk into Smith. So we think that we're adequately supplying parking. However, in the case of a party or a get together, there is additional parking across the street on the back side. I can't remember the name of the street, Carolyn. Yeah, um, Musanti Drive. Yeah. So the, there is additional parking on the street. It's not directly adjacent to this. It's just a few steps away. But there is uh, potential parking that is not, you know, on the lawn kind of a thing, blocking traffic or anything like that. I think to this particular space, there's no ability to park if you if you you can't park there illegally and feel like you're not going to get hit it's does not it's not inviting to a condition like that i don't think there's any on street parking on prince and chapel street right, right there so yeah any other questions when i'm here well, I guess so then um, in, in terms of that's a great description and that's what we hope that uh, many of the tenants won't have cars. They'll be dealing with other things. So my inclination is to think that perhaps your bike facility is way undersized. If you've only room for seven bicycles, I believe, mm -hmm. out of 22 apartments, mm -hmm. <clears throat> some of the apartments may have children, might have children. They're definitely gonna, at least 50% will have bikes. Um, so I, I believe as we see in apartment buildings around town, they get left in front of the stairs, they get chained to the, the bike, to the post, the lighting post. Um, I, I know you're really maxed out in terms of space, but I, would, I guess I would appreciate and recommend that you try to figure out a way to expand that bike shelter, um, because I think you will find that many of your tenants are gonna have bikes because of proximity to the bike path to the other campus across the street. Yeah. So number one, I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to having too many bikes. The the provisions of the bylaw were, I believe, 2.5 or something in that range bicycles for that quantity of residents. So we exceeded that by quite a bit. Um, there is potentially more room to squeeze more bicycles. We allotted you know, lockable space for seven bicycles. There's more. However, I do believe that some of the tenants are going to keep their bicycles safe and secured in the basement that we're allowing them individual 
uh, storage spaces to each unit. They don't have to pay for this on their own. This is a part uh, given to them uh, and organized in in the complex. And if for that, if we just take a moment to talk about energy efficiency and utility that we're planning on, if you don't mind. So one of the things that we're always concerned is energy efficiency. And um, the building itself is designed around net zero. And uh, we're making provisions for um, fresh air. Uh, we're even going to monitor the fresh air in the building and make adjustments as necessary. <laughs> we're including uh, hot water and heating for the whole building because we find out that there's more savings to be had as a general, not individually for the each unit, but rather as a whole, that we are supplying hot water and heating and cooling to the whole building. And that would be inclusive in their rent. Um, I'll stop there. No solar arrays on the roof. We're, we're planning absolutely on maximizing the solar array on all the roofs. To, to supplement for that great use of energy. It's all electric. And those flat roofs. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're in, right now we're in discussions with the solar company to get exactly the estimate, but what we assume is that all the roofs will not provide for all the units and all the use. So therefore we're just going to maximize the solar panels available on the roof. They're required to do that by the ordinance, but also the building code um, to be um, ready, solar ready. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of the bike um, storage, they're only required that number, small number of covered storage. Um, but, you know, as Shell mentioned, they have the uh, basement storage units as well. So that would count as bike storage. Um, and so they definitely exceed the requirement for covered storage. I don't know who drew up that ordinance. Yeah, get it done. Um, and I appreciate. I think your um, your organization is going to occupy the office building. Yes. So it'll be in your best interest that it's <clears throat> maintained and uh, bicycles are yeah. put aside and whatever. Okay. Because often in apartment buildings, yeah, folks don't have enough storage room. And things get clustered outside of the entrances and patios. So um, it's great that you're providing that storage space in the basement. I think being a, a landlord and being there at all times is going to provide, you know, an extra car careful eye on the building and the services and so forth going into the going forward. We're planning on owning this for a long time. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I'd like to open it up to the public if that's okay. Yeah. Is there anybody at this point who would like to come forward and? We go through two parts of my question. It's probably going to be the epic. First, I'd like to ask the um, board just for advice. Thank you so much for, oh, actually, let me get closer to the mic. Thank you so much, Mr. Perry, for actually. Um, and you are again here. Talk to us. Okay? Oh, sorry. All right. Yeah. I do want to thank um, Mr. Perry for being willing, um, as they said, to um, rezone parcel 11. Are we on that? to um, URB that takes out most of my issues um, with it. But I do want to um, just ask how that affects, um, I have a whole list of reasons why I wanted to um, stop somebody. I want to talk about the special permit, which um, the language in both the um, narrative and uh, in the special permit actually set, asks to uh, expand the boundaries of Plan Village District approved area to make the design guidelines for original geographic area applicable to the project site. Uh, both documents um, here say that the project site uh, at, will now, what we refer to now as the project site consists of the properties um, with the following parcel IDs, 12, which is 31 chapel, 11, which is zero chapel, and 13, which is 33 chapel. So that would, in effect, that if approved as it reads, would actually make that design um, guidelines for PV eligible for 33 Chapel Street. Can I ask, um, can I ask you? 
Yeah, ask us. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, ahead. Asking, yep. I'm seeing a head shake that that wouldn't happen. But everything I read here actually reads that. It's in the application. Yeah, I can. So I, and my page here, I just have it's 38, 11, and 12, not 13. Okay, you're seeing that um, this is on the um, right here on the um, map, lots of lots in project. Okay, Carolyn, I'll that, turn to you for. So, um, yeah, we've gone over this several times. Right. Um, okay. There are um, <laughs> the entire project, um, the entire um, sort of modification. Um, included little slivers of 33 chapel because there was that swap. So there was an A&R submitted. Mm -hmm. So to ensure that it was clear which parcels were sort of on the table, that doesn't mean that the zoning is changed for 33 Chapel. Um, the plan, there are two things. There's a planned village special permit, which is for a planned village. And those boundaries are changing to incorporate 30 one chapel where the buildings that you see up right, there right that's different from the planned village zone um the so the planned village is so there's the planned village zoning that was adopted to incorporate this part this property but then the special permit that was granted originally um to every other property that was previously in the planned village zone um, this is a special permit amendment so that um, that original um, permit that was geographically smaller than it now is right. will incorporate this piece. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, and it is confusing, there's a planned village zone and then the yeah. planned village special permit. So um, this has nothing to do with any changes that would happen to 30 um, three chapel for the zoning. So there's no um, uses that would be allowed in planned village for 33 chapel, which is the single family home, and that won't change. And there are many properties in the city that have little slivers. So when you switch the AR, we discussed this two weeks ago, you have little slivers of um, zoning. Um, they don't change what's allowed on the on a property where it's primarily zoned a different zone, but we have those all over the city. Does that help? It is a little confusing because of the language. Well, it's it actually says the site includes, and it does say 33 chapel and uh, parcel 13. And that would be defined, referred to as the project site in quotes here. Then down here at the bottom, it says, is sought as part of a project to expand the boundaries of, plan, of the planned village district approved area and make the design guidelines for the original geographic area applicable to the project site. Now, if the project site mm. is, you know, parcel 13 and 11 and 33 yeah. Chapel Street. No, I, I think we're talking about those that when 33 Chapel, those little slivers that we, a couple of weeks ago, um, swapped with that a and &R. It doesn't extend to the single family lot. I understand, but that's really not what it says in the permit. And that's what I'm objecting to is that it does seem to that from what this is saying, the design standards, which has a lot greater density, zero parking, is going to be ex expanded into the project site. And it's listed in both the um, project narrative, page seven on the bound site plan and per, uh, special permit, and on the special permit, um, page two. And also on page one, it lists the project work addresses 33, zero, and 33. And again, it's the same thing. It lists Yep. That the intention of the um, special permit is to expand uh, the approved area and make design guidelines for the original ge geographic area to the project site, which is defined as thirty three. Yep. Uh, no, I understand. I, I understand the 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 legalese there of the documents as they're written. I don't know now if we can amend those that language just to clarify it. It's not necessary, yeah. and and the plans themselves show exactly what's happening. So I think plans that's on, uh, yeah. yeah. So we've taken your comment into consideration. We appreciate your concern, but um, we think the way that the board is representing it now and the applicant, 
uh, there's no nefarious intent around um, the property at 33. So where it says it expands it to the project site, no. it doesn't do that. Is there any way to, and you can't change that language, so it doesn't say that? Well, the plans as submitted, the, the drawings as submitted, they pretty much um, show us what the project is going to entail, the boundary lines there. Okay, so there's no way to clarify so, this language? That language, no. It is... Um, the you Mr. Perry's um offer to rezone um parcel 11 to URB acceptable to the board. I'm not going to pursue that at this point. We're just going to look at the plans today, the site plan permit, and the amendment. I don't know if uh the board wants to entertain that discussion now, but I think if we go into that, I think it, it the ordinance isn't, isn't in our purview right now. Okay. Okay, that's something that Mr. Perry can work with the ward counselor, perhaps, um, in terms of that zoning ordinance. But okay, but so it's not within our purview tonight. Okay, so there's no way to. I'm 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 sorry. Yeah. Okay, so pretty much it's it, the special permit will be passed with that language in it. Yes, probably so. Yep. Okay. If the special permit gets passed tonight. Okay, and um, I guess that's it. I could watch the Bruins. Uh, but thank you, Mr. Perry, for for council I hope that goes to. Thanks for having me. I'm Karen Foster. I from Northampton. I'm the Ward Two City Councilor, um, and I just wanted to speak sort of generally about the the project in the neighborhood. Um, Mr. Perry, the applicant, has been um, incredibly willing to work with the neighborhood. Um, there have been. Uh, two neighborhood meetings, including not the last snowstorm, but the one before that, um, we had hot cocoa and looked at the site plans. Um, you... So, yo, you all missed that. Yeah, yeah. There was there was hot cocoa. It, it was it was an, a nice afternoon. Um, but his responsiveness um, and work with the people nearby, I think, has has really um, led to some some good relations there. Um, you know, the design fits within the Plan Village neighborhood. Um, you know, similar. I just wanted to address a couple of things. One is about the parking um, that you brought up um, as well. And, you know, that that neighborhood is one. It's kind of just on the outskirts of town. Um, I know multiple people who live there who do not have a car and have no problem um, between bus and bike and walking. Um, so it's, it's an easily <clears throat> um, pedestrian and cycling friendly um, spot to live. Um, and, you know, it seems likely to me that one parking spot per unit um, would definitely do that. And then right across um, Prince Street in Village Hill, there's quite a bit of on-street parking um, that's not in any danger of filling up. Um, so there's there's quite a bit there. Um, let's see, there was the question about cutting through and just I'm, I'm speaking to this. This is also my neighborhood. Um, so I, I know this area quite well and, and it's interesting the cars aren't cutting through right now um but it sure seems like they could because it's just a whole bunch of um pavement um the one i i talked with uh, mr perry about this um the one thing i would ask you to consider is the exit um, and the plans are up there the exit onto chapel street um is showing right now um two-way you may consider a right turn only there. Um, the L3 driveway across Chapel Street is also right turn only, but it's very close to the light and um, traffic gets congested there and it kind of backs up. So um, that's that's kind of the only thing in the traffic plans or, or in the plans for all of this, I would ask you to look at more carefully. Um, otherwise, um, I think this project is going to provide um, Housing, um, housing inventory at a level that is not that that there's a great need for in the city, um, you know, and it's metrics. I, I don't want to speak ill of it because it was actually a really beloved auto repair shop, like a, an awful lot of people brought their cars there um, and love that. But as far as um, this spot in the way, um, as mentioned, sort of as a gateway going into multiple um, streets, I think this is going to be huge aesthetic improvement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and and the accessible units and the parking and the landscaping, um, you know, I'm I'm definitely excited about this project going into the neighborhood. Um, so I just wanted to make sure those comments uh, were on the record for you as you're considering this tonight. Great, yep. thank you, Councilor. And my apologies in advance. I probably mm. won't stick around for your discussion, but thank you. Any other comments? Um, 
Carolyn, is there anybody who's chatted to us? There is one comment um, from Jacqueline's iPhone. Hold up. Could the planning board please speak to the number of required EV parking places for the new multifamily construction and development projects? Okay. Yes, we can do that. Yep. Um, there are... The requirement is for 25 parking spaces um, that there be um, conduit, I think, put in for, let me just get the standard so I don't read it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is fairly recently. We went through this mm -hmm. new ordinance about yep. um, expanded parking, new parking. Mm. Sorry, it's in the parking section. Um, for new or expanded parking lots that result in the provision of 25 or more spaces, one electrical vehicle charging port space for 15 parking spaces shall be installed. So we have 22 spaces here. Yep. So that's 15 and a half. So they would need to put, right, there's two. So it definitely meets the requirement. Well, they're not required because it's not 25 spaces or more. Ah, right. So they are providing. Right. So then it goes down to the 15 is how much you provide. So I just clarify, it, it doesn't matter for this project, but I'm just curious. So they're not required to put any parking on this parcel, but Correct. if they did put 25 on, then they would be required to meet the EV standards. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And I, I would suggest where we're going with the EV purchases in the region that the applicant might want to provide some more conduit for the future while he's tearing up that lot to other locations um just because that's the way we're going um so i have a quick question about the uh, egress and the access for pedestrians i know the applicant showed us that there's going to be a crosswalk from the parking lot across um prince street to the dmh building and then the pedestrians will access that sidewalk but there's nothing going across to the to the other side across chapel street where a lot of residents live also. Um, I don't live up in that neighborhood. I'm not sure how many pedestrians are there at this point, but I, and I don't know if you thought there was a conflict with the entrance to the, the large industrial building, LK30 there, but uh, there is a sidewalk on that other side of the street. I see people coming there or leaving there to get on that side of the street to ride their bicycles down the hill or to go back down um, the street towards um, the other part of uh, Earl Street and all. So I wondered if the applicant, yeah, please do. Yeah, sorry. So um, DPW, we had a conversation internally with DPW about the safest route for to um, direct pedestrians back to that light. So it would be crossing over onto the Prince Street side so that they could get to that um, crossing that then goes um, down the hill um, because there's no sidewalk on that the parcel side of Chapel Street, right? So um, you so so there's no sidewalk on this property side along Chapel right. Street. and and so then there would be a concern about, doing a mid-block crosswalk across Chapel Street there. So, But there is a sidewalk on the other side of Chapel Street that borders LK3. Just from L3 down towards yeah. town. Right. So in this um, routing, it would go, um, you know, pedestrians would then be directed north to Prince and then east, as opposed to 
south and east. So it's in terms of where they're cross. There's no way to have a crossing. It's not safe to put a crossing across Chapel Street right at that driveway entrance. Uh -huh. Is the point uh -huh. okay. because it's mid block right b before you get to the signal. Okay. And so the safest way to direct pedestrians back to that signal if they wanted to cross chapel would be on the less traveled Prince Street side. Yeah, yeah, I get it. It's unfortunate, though, because as that becomes a popular place, I mean, there's no as you go down um, uh, Chapel Street or go out Chapel Street towards the jail. And you get to the church at the corner of, I forget what that street is. Yeah, at Laurel, there's no crosswalk there at that intersection. Um, so, but I understand that it's difficult because of the conflicts of the two driveways to put a crosswalk there. I don't know if we can ask for a crosswalk to be put in. That doesn't bring people then to a sidewalk down on Laurel Street. Right. Um, so that whole area then is bereft of any kind of pedestrian access to this. On the corner. opposite side. Right. 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 Counselor. I figured I'd use counselor privilege to maybe speak out of turn. Um, that That is the lack of a crosswalk walk there is a concern of the neighborhood. Um, and it's come up because there is affordable housing coming in on Laurel Street. There's also a proposed um, affordable housing for Chapel Street, um, just west a little bit um, past Rust Ave. And so I've had some conversations previously with Director Fiden, um, Director Mesh, I don't think you and I have talked about this yet, um, but looking at how to help pedestrians cross Chapel Street safely, right where the um, this proposed project is, there's really poor sight lines and there is that traffic light. Um, I'm going to concur that I I don't think I want to see pedestrian access everywhere, but I wouldn't encourage people to cross there. Um, but crossing over Prince um, feels much safer. But it's a bigger picture conversation for that area to come up with a safe crossing because um, there is a lot of pedestrian traffic going across Chapel to Laurel to the community right. gardens into Ellerbrook. And there will be more when that other units are built. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you for indulging me. Great. All right. Other questions from the board? Remind me, I'm not sure who's going to remind me, where this, where's the PVTA bus stop? And right in front of the gates, the old gates of the state hospital? Counselor. Yes. Here I am again. Yes, um, Village Hill, right in front of the gatehouse there. And that's the only stop, and then it goes up to the, the jail. The, Coming that way, or yes, or there is one um, at the in the far end of Grove and Chapel, um, and I don't remember if it stops at Laurel and Chapel. Forty-eight Chapel. Does it, it stop at Forty-eight? Someone's there, someone's there waiting. So we have people okay. walk down to Forty-eight. Yep. Okay. All right. But the main stop is there in front of the old gates, in front of yep. Okay. So it's pretty close. If they people and cross across, um, use the sidewalk to go across Prince Street to that sidewalk. And the applicant is uh, putting in a new concrete sidewalk across all of the Prince Street frontage all the way to the end of the property. Okay. Um, do we have to, do we need to grant the applicant a waiver for two curb cuts? In it's part of your library. site plan approval to um so site plan approval is um wouldn't in, also includes the question about two curb cuts so in this scenario um i don't know how many you count that exist there but narrowing it down to create i mean it, do you are allowed to grant it for the purposes of um safe um flow of traffic you know councilor foster did um raise the question about whether there should be a right only restriction. Um, DPW did not have a concern with that given the low volume of, of traffic and people coming out of that parking lot can see pretty readily where there's traffic backed up and could opt to turn off of, onto Prince Street to get to the light um, if they're going eastbound as opposed to trying to cross over traffic. Um, so I think that was DPW's sort of uh, certainly didn't raise any concerns about that. Um. Just in terms of process, I recognize that, do we have two votes here? One for the special permit amendment and one for the site plan? 
No, you could. I mean, in some cases you might do that, but it's not necessary. You can take a motion on voting the approval of the special permit amendment along with a site plan for the site as described, in, including the, you know, the the layout that's shown with the two with the two curb cuts and the 27 plus thousand square feet of new construction. So kind of just the way it's written on our agenda, we could just yeah. motion that way. Yeah. I move the quick on the comment. I'll second. Okay. Motions were made to close the public comment. Any discussion? Do we have we asked all of our questions to the applicant in terms of technical responses? Uh, I'm seeing a one on the screen. Is there an additional comment? No. Okay. That was left over. Okay. That's that screen, not my screen. I see. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. <laughs> Could we delay the vote just for a minute? Okay. Um, so, Carolyn, in, in in terms of the 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 two votes combining it to one, I mean, one of the special permit needs it's required of five or seven members, and the other one's required just four or seven members. I don't know if that kind of conflates that. Um, well, that's what I'm saying is if there were a concern about you know if you wanted to split the vote and make sure that you had a quorum for or it may, you know that the vote passed. Yeah. If you don't feel like it's not right. it's not necessary, so right. you can have. Um, you can merge them together. It's what whatever you feel is okay. um, best. All right. Okay. We were given a list of questions that the staff um, raised with the applicants probably a few weeks ago that the applicant responded to, um, and they they seem to have uh, understood all the questions. And I'm I'm just trying to make sure that I'm. Uh, there was a revised photo uh, metric plan yeah. given to us, which is good. Um, this is a splendid looking project. It is. Okay. Talk, uh, talk to me a little bit about the enclosure for the uh, recyclables and trash. It looks like it's all enclosed. You're not going to have a rollout dumpster there. They're going to be the regular residential rollout and wheels how are you gonna empty that it's a very good question and i actually had a lengthy discussion with um the city engineer today regarding that um so there's going to be the typical 64 gallon containers that you roll out basically there's going to be three, I believe, for trash and three for recycling. I mean, there's a total of five on either side. Five on either side. Okay. So the enclosure, as you saw in the architectural drawings, is, you know, open and there's a there's an entrance point on the back side and then on the front side. We have a four foot wide concrete apron. Um, and the only intent for that apron is for the disposal or the refuge company to be able to access that enclosure to bring out the containers to the truck. And um, Mr. Perry has communicated with the um, disposal company and the, all worked out all the logistics basically. And this is a, a common practice that he uses on a couple other of his sites. So, um, you know, it is effective. Okay, thank you. All righty, motion's been made and seconded to close the public hearing. Any more discussion? All right, all those in favor of closing the public hearing? I'm sorry to do this again, but I think there is something on the screen. There's a chat on the screen, Yep. Yeah. Thank you for seeing that. So, <laughs> they snuck in under the wire. <laughs> I should have sound like this. Yeah, right, right. Now we can track them better. Okay, this. Laptop the other way and then. Uh, the last comment just before we close public hearing was to thank one of the members of the planning board for iterating that this is a splendid looking project. So they're just throwing some nice compliments your way, Sam. 
Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded for close the public hearing. Um, hearing no other discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye, it's unanimous. All right. Other questions among the board members? Accolades? I think it's a splendid looking project that we should vote on. Um, so what would the language be like in that vote, in that motion? Carolyn uh, gave us a few. Yeah, so I can just, so the, so from based on DPW comments, um, I submitted some proposed conditions that basically revised plans before, which is standard condition, revised um, plans prior to um, construction that show edits to the plan sheets there were some errors that needed to be addressed um and um that that would be wrapped in um also to perform a test pit um, to confirm that the subsurface infiltration system will um, be above seasonal high groundwater as uh, dmps require mm -hmm. um and <laughs> that um Granite curbing shall be installed for 33 Chapel Street driveway. All details should be in compliance with the city street standard. And uh, the property owners must inspect and maintain the proposed stormwater management system to ensure the system continues to function according to design and in good working condition. And then prior to a certificate of occupancy, the final long-term operations and maintenance plan must be reported at the registry of deeds after staff signs off on the final language to ensure that it's compliant with the city standard. And then also um, a lighting as built stamped by an engineer shall be submitted showing compliance with the approved plans. After after construction. Right. Um, Prior okay. to the of okay. And the applicant, I'm sure, has heard those and that we can't ask them specifically, but I'm sure they're okay with those. Um yeah, so I'm I'm always somewhat leery of these subsurface treatment um facilities. Um the onus is on the applicant to clean them and manage them and maintain them. Um, we're seeing more and more of those as time goes on. Um, so it's going to be interesting 15 or 20 years from now. I won't be around on the planning board then. Okay. Um, so does somebody have those extra little conditions and feel comfortable in making a motion? Wrapping up the two of these applications. I move to approve the special permit and amendment and major site plan uh, at 31 Chapel Street, map ID 38A-11 and 12 with the conditions previously specified by Carolyn. Thank you, Jenna. Is there a second? Thank you, Stacy. So the motion's been made and seconded to approve the plans as submitted with the conditions. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Appears to be unanimous. Good luck with your project, folks. Look forward to seeing it completed. Thank you. And I must say that the reason the project showed to you that way is because of the work that we could do in town previous to presenting it to you. And that just you know, gives us all the opportunity to respond to questions and great the process is great. Great. It makes our job so much easier here on Thursday night. So thank you, Carolyn. That was kudos to you. And thank you for joining us and representing the Laurel Street neighborhood. Go to even we can't talk about it today. Okay. Um, there's a before we go any further, there's a couple of our items. Um, we don't have any minutes, but we do have one A and R. I left the paper <laughs> So I'm hearing that alibi over and over again. Um, this is just um, a lot. This is a lot on um, Maynard Road off of Elm Street, just creating a 50 foot by um, 85. Let's see. Yeah, please. 
4,400 square foot lot. So the depth is 89 feet, but you're really just looking at the frontage. The remaining frontage um, will be more than sufficient to comply. Um, so this is not a subdivision because it, there's existing frontage on a public way. I move to endorse the ANR and Maynard Street. Second. This has been made and seconded on the Maynard Street ANR. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Another unanimous vote by the Northampton Planning Board. Well done. 